Nice. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, afternoon, morning, wh whichever, whatever uh, applies to where you are. Um, I'm going to um, walk you through <clears throat> um, a geological uh, phenomenon that took place in Trinidad um, back in 2018. And some of the sort of logical steps that we sort of followed to try to unravel what occurred in this area. So for those who don't know where Trinidad is, Trinidad is the south, southernmost island of the Caribbean. Um, our geology is actually very much um, South American in nature. Uh, we're uh, oil and gas uh, province. We've been producing oil for about a hundred and something years. Um, one of the first oil wells to ever be drilled in the world um, was drilled in Trinidad in 1857. It's uh, since then we've 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 drilled about 13,000 or so wells. We produce quite a lot of oil. Um, we we're actually now a gas economy, um, producing lots of gas from offshore and onshore. Um, this is the island of Trinidad, and we're a twin island republic. This is our um, Tobago, the second island. And the area that we're going to be looking at in particular occurs in the oil fields um, in the southern part of Trinidad, and that's the Low Sea Road area. And one of the things that's quite common to the states about Trinidad is that it's the graveyard of geologists, um, meaning that the geology has um, been uh, so complex that uh, many people spend their entire careers trying to unravel what's going on here. So back in August 21st, 2018, at about 5.30 p.m. local time, um, there was an earthquake that occurred um, just offshore um, Venezuela, northern coast of Venezuela. And um, this earthquake basically um, it, it, it was recorded as 7.3 on the um, Richter scale. I mean, we've, there are variations of, um, of how strong it was. It, the values range from 7.3 to 6.9. But by and large, the earthquake occurred in Venezuelan waters, just offshore of Venezuela, along a series of um, strikes, slip falls, which occur in this area. And this is not, this is not something um, that's that's uncommon. We are very much accustomed to many earthquakes occurring in and around Trinidad. This is by and large a, 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 an active margin. And along this active margin, we have a series of plates interacting with each other um, with a sort of complex um, uh, subduction zone. The earthquake um, basically struck at a depth of 146 um, kilometers. And it was basically place at the subduction zone between South America and the Caribbean plate. Um, and if you go with the Pindel, Jim Pindel's models of the interaction between the Caribbean plate and the South American plate, there's actually another slab below this, which is, a, which is referred to as a proto-Caribbean plate, another subduction zone which existed um, before, and the slab still remains there. So we have the Caribbean plate basically subducting the South American plate at this area over here. And that's the boundary on which the, um, the, the earthquake occurred. So the earthquake was felt there and it was, and, and we had very strong field, field reports in the northern part of Trinidad. Um, a number of businesses in the northern part of Trinidad, including oil companies, um, suffered some damages to their buildings, uh, minor damages, albeit, um, but a couple of days later, reports started to emerge in the media of significant damage in the low zero area, which is quite actually unusual. Um, it occurs on the southern coast of the island. And because it's on the south coast, it's actually really far away from um, where the earthquake would have occurred. Yet the damage um, coming out of there um, was actually pretty mind boggling. So um, this is a geological map of Trinidad. And we're looking at this area out on the south coast over here. And yeah, 
this picture speaks a thousand words. The sort of damage we see occurring in the low zero area. This is actually one of the big ruptures that occurred. For scale, that's me and a, and a few other geologists standing over here. And that's actually, um, I think that's Saeed standing over there. And, um, and yeah, it's a, it's a huge uh, fall that, that, um, that ripped through the area, completely offsetting the roads. Now, the thing about Los Zero is that it's actually a very much agricultural area. So, um, and, and there aren't actually any um, electricity or, or in significant infrastructure at all. Um, just a couple farming houses and the farmers use these houses just when they're, when they're planting the crops and stuff. So they're not necessarily there all, all of the time. Um, what the villagers uh, reported was that they felt the earthquake, yeah, but then a couple hours later, they started hearing um, um, noises, um, they, feel, they felt further tremors, um, and at this point in time, it's pretty much nighttime, um, some of them came out of their houses with torchlights to see what was going on. And they couldn't even find the roadway to their homes. So for instance, this house over here, a guy named Mr. Nobby lived over here. And actually, um, this is the road to his house. And he usually would drive his tractor to the fields over here. But his tractor could not even move over some of the small falls here, albeit the the 20 foot faults that we see across this area afterwards. His excavator was completely stuck over there. So some, some, a lot of um, damage occurred um, at that time and the, these things came to light the next morning when people started um, to go around the area and look at the damage. The ponds themselves that they used for the agriculture were completely dried out um, in first, and the agricultural equipment was stuck. They also went down on the beach and noticed that the beach area got uplifted. So this beach was flat just like this, but it was then uplifted. And far from being uplifted, um, some analysis on the area afterwards actually showed that the coastline moved outward to the south by about 100 meters. So some pretty interesting um, happenings there. So we, the AAPG Young Professionals Trinidad and Tobago chapter, we um, went about um, scouting out this area when it was reported in the media and um, we started to examine the area. Um, I'll, so from this sort of overview drone imagery over here, I'm just pointing out a few areas that we will be talking about in more detail. Um, Here's a leaning World War II tower. That it was actually leaning before the earthquake and it did not um, change after it, the earthquake. Uh, this is the, the popular beach area at Los Zero itself. This is Taparo Point, one of the, the most southerly um, part of this peninsula. And here's the area of significant slumping. And here's Mr. Nobby's house, the area that, uh, that was affected the most. So that's the tower, World War II leaning tower, which was not affected by the earthquake. Um, when we look at the access roads to the area, you can see that the area that's being affected is over here. And there's actually just two roads which lead into this area. So because the roads got significantly damaged, um, folks could not necessarily get out of this area as well as they would have liked. So it's, not really populated. The population is really along the main roads running through the country here and down at the beach area here. So not much going on inside here other than agriculture, which is luckily good. Yeah. Topography wise, um, the South Coast area is actually um, part of an anticlinal system, which is called the Southern Anticline. And the topography actually matches that very well. Uh, we've got some rivers flowing through some low areas to the north over here. And this area generally is pretty high and sloping towards the sea. And the area affected, most of it actually slopes towards the sea, but some of it actually sits on the plateau. 
The surface geology of the area shows that we've got a series of mud volcanoes throughout here. Um, the bigger part of pool of them are called the Erin Booth mud volcanoes. And they all occur along the crest of the southern anticline. The rocks in this area are crews and lower crews at surface. That's late Miocene. The oldest set of rocks are late Miocene in age over here. And they generally get younger towards the north and also younger towards the south. So these are the colors inside here represent younger sequences of deltaics going northward. So typical anticline, older rocks in the middle, younger rocks on either side, and mud volcanism occurs along it. That's no, um, that's no surprise in a lot of the anticlines we have in Trinidad, we do have some form of mud volcanism occurring at the crest of them. And mud, mud volcanoes are quite popular. We, um, they're quite touristic as well. People go and bathe in them and stuff. So um, this drone imagery um, was acquired just after the earthquake. And uh, we were able to use this imagery to, to, under, to look at the faulting from um, on a larger scale and, um, and to understand um, how it relates to the geology of the area. So we saw a major fault rupture running through the area. And this fault rupture was actually left lateral. So we have these roads, for instance, this road in particular was actually a dead north-south oriented road, straight road. And the road was actually shifted to the south um, because of the movement on the fault. We saw the, this is the location where um, I was showing you before with the significant motion of the fault along the road. So the road is broken in two places here with significant um, movement towards the southeast. And we've got some subtle movement along this part of the road over here. This is Mr. Nobby's house in the middle here. And there are a series of faults all inside here as well. So what we, we, we can start to actually um, pencil on some of these um, faults and, and features in here. And what we recognized was that we saw um, these, we have uh, some mud volcanism occurring along here, um, some second sides as well. And uh, what I'm going to do is fly you across this area and show you what we saw on the ground and also what we see from the drone imagery itself. Uh, just want to point out to you that here, we see the coastline itself has been shifted outward by 106 meters. And this is the coastline before the earthquake. Right, so when we, first thing we do as geologists, we go and we check out all of the faults in the area and what was occurring along the faults. So we walked up along this road and we saw this big separation occurring over here. And as you can see, the area actually also moved a little bit downward as well. But by and large, the, the second sides over here are generally west to east in orientation, suggesting that they're mostly um, strike slip in orientation rather than dip slip. And interestingly, what I'm going to tell you about afterwards is that where um, this young lady is standing over here, something has emerged in that area um, very recently this year. So we have second sides occurring in this area, um, eight to 10 degrees to the fall plane. Most of the motion is lateral. This is a, a, an a shot from the area above. You can see how the road is nicely broken, very, very clean across the area there. And this area also became a, a sort of muddy pool and there were also some bubbles and stuff occurring here at the point in time when we investigated. So these are some of the second sites that we noted at this location over here. So 
very, very nice, clean silicon sides. It, it's really good to see some of this um, new tectonics in, in action that um, these things will not be preserved for long. In fact, they're all gone now um, because they're all muds. But it was really good to, to see that, um, that we had these striations um, from, from very early on. So um, we're walking along the road here and heading towards the east. And there's a big break crossing the road over here. And that's us sitting on top of the road over here and it's basically dropped down. A nice um, clean, clear cut, um, normal fault. <clears throat> and so we see that the faults are basically now dipping towards the east in this area. As we come up to Ms. the road to Mr. Nobby's home, so he's got this red dirt sort of road, and now this is this is what the road looks like. So this is his um, excavator over here. This guy is almost seven feet tall from Sambaje, and literally he's inside um, one of these um, big rotated blocks inside here. So it's it's really been broken up quite a lot. Pretty um. Pretty amazing stuff. So the stuff you only see like in movies and stuff, right? And then down on the beach. So we came down to the beach area over here. And we see that the beach itself has been uplifted. This is this is the beach sand on the beach itself. And this is actually beach sand over here as well. The beach sand is undisturbed, just lifted up. And these are the muds. Um, in the bedrock below the beach being lifted up. And what we noted about it was that it actually lifted up in a series of, of tow trusts across the area. And these trusts, um, basically some of, most of them were preserved at the time when we visited, but they eventually got washed away by the high tides. But you can actually map out um, a bunch of these trusts heading into, a, into the sea. So these trusts are, are features that typically form at the base of, a, of an extensional system. So up the extension is usually related to down the compression. So just flying across the area, here's a drone map for reference where we, where we are, where we're looking at, that um, yellow um, square there. And here's a pretty um, big break in the road again over here. We see really, really big um, slips occurring near the house. All of these faults over here are purely dip slip. And uh, they're, they're on a scale of 20 to 25 feet of slip on, the, on these. Here's a big fault rupture running along the area. And this fault rupture is the one with primarily strike slip motion, left lateral actually. This is the brake that we were sitting on over here. It's dip slip towards the east. Bunch of these other falls at Mr. Nobby's house are all dip slip to the south. And these are dip slip to the east. You can see really nicely how the, the, the agricultural land here, the garden area is all broken up and it's all really dip slip faults down to the south. <clears throat> Just looking at it from another angle over here, this is the, the strike slip rupture running along the area. Nice left lateral motion. And it runs all the way out to the south coast as well. So it comes down all the way to the coast itself. And it sort of defines where this to a trust belt starts. These are the ponds that were drained out. They were usually filled all the way up to the top over here. And as the area opened up, Water went down, never to return. This is where the fault rupture runs 
all the way towards the west where it dies out and has very little offset along this roadway over here. And it's just disturbing the, the ground just all the way there. No significant faulting at it anywhere else. So when we looked at this, we looked at the, we like to look at the sort of regional fault pattern and to see how does this fault fit into the regional fault pattern. We know that we've got a southwest and northeast trending anticlinal system, which is called the southern anticline. And within this, we've got these older rocks, the lower cruise formation occurring at surface. And we generally have um, younger and younger rocks towards the north and younger rocks towards the south. This is also, as I said, the area that is prone to mud volcanism and stuff. So with the axis of the anticline running through the area, we also expect um, trust faults to mimic that sort of area because these anticlines are formed by southeast trending trusts. So as these uh, anticlines are, are forming uh, by these southeastly verging trusts, you tend to get perpendicular or orthogonal to that extensional systems or what we refer to as tear faults. The faults that sort of dissect the anticline and basically allow extension along the anticline. So um, we've got um, a plot on over here, the orientation of our second sides, which are generally east-west here, mostly to the south here. And I've also got some faults on this side, which are dipping towards the west. Most of these faults are dipping towards the east, and these faults are dipping towards the south. So the surface geology sort of fits with the area and the, the truss faulting also fits with what we see so far. The main fault rupture looks like it could be an actual fault in the area. Um, <clears throat> I also work with a company called Touchstone Exploration, as I mentioned, and Touchstone Exploration has an oil field just in the north of this area that, that we're studying now. And this oil field, which occurs um, just off the main roads over here, the South Power Cycle Field, um, has, uh, um, has been mapped um, from the subsurface wells um, on the cruise formation, which all crops to the south over here. And on that, on those maps, they show that they've got a plunging anticline and also it's been dissected by these northwest southeast trending faults, which create compartments throughout the field. These faults are defined based on the well data, and there's quite a lot of well data throughout there. So it's interesting that this fault pattern occurs here. Maybe that's what we're seeing over here, but does it actually fit with our model? We need to get some more data to analyze that. So that's just um, overlaying the fault pattern on surface geology. We've got our truss faults and our extensional sort of faults. So looking at the area in a little more detail, I, again, this is the topography of the area. It's quite a big high plateau over here, but clearly the areas further towards the east are all dipping towards the coast. And so no doubt this area inside here appears as if it's slipping towards the coast. But what exactly is going on on top here as well? <clears throat> so from the drone uh, mapping, we were able to also derive um, a drone elevation and match that to the elevation of the area, which matched pretty well. Albeit, we know that this area has been affected since the, the previous topo, topo maps would um, predate that. We can see nicely where the slippage seems to be um, occurring and, and most of it occurs in this area. We also did um, another set of drone mapping at, another, at a, a few weeks later, and we've done a um, series of drone maps across the area. And what we can do from those is that we are able to look at which areas are still moving and basically um, a simple elevation change over time. 
So what we see is that this area on the plateau is not um, moving, it's not um, being deformed anymore, it's not slipping, but most of the motion is occurring in this area towards the southeast, which ties well with the topo, with the actual topography of the area. So looking at this a lot more closely, we can see the actual faults themselves, which are continuing to slip. They are denoted here by the peaks, the ridges, right? Those are areas where we have a high change in elevation. So you get all of these ridges occurring inside here, where the topography of the area is constantly changing week by week in this area. Um, I, we also um, partnered with the civil engineering group in UWE and in, in University of the West Indies. And they've got like a handheld Geiger counter, which is just um, another means of, um, of assessing the radioactivity along um, these faults. So what their studies show is that along faults, you tend to get high um, CPM values. And those CPM values corroborate with the areas that we actually found those faults. So it's just an independent way of assessing these large fractures and faults across the area. Are they um, jiving with, the, with, um, with what you find typically along faults? So when this occurred, there was actually a lot of debate um, as to what exactly happened here. I'm going to try to go through these possibilities. Um, and, and work out with you um, the different types of data that we have, what's supporting it, and what does not support it. So what really transpired? First case put forward, a very popular case put forward is, it's a landslide, That's basically simple mass wasting. So in a landslide, you typically have a main scarp, you mean your minor scarp on the sides, which is usually uh, which can be interpreted as a fault as the area slips along it. Um, and then usually at the base you have toe, toe thrusting um, with the, as the extension is being taken up in the compressional features at the base. I, uh, and most, most people tend to draw um, landslides like this. I prefer look at it from a sort of three-dimensional view instead. What you expect to occur within this landslide is that you have sinistral um, slippage on one side, dextral slippage on the other side, and toe thrusting at the base with a scar at the top. This is actually um, uh, when, when the earthquake occurred um, and this slippage occurred. Um, one, of those, uh, one, of the, one of these experts in, um, had produced this map by comparing the um, topography of the area over time and basically calculated a displacement factor for the area, showing a lot of displacement occurring here. And they believe that this is actually the extent of the slide that occurred in the area. So uh, I'm not gonna argue that. There is definitely some slippage occurring, but let's look at the data in a little more detail. And in a landslide, as we said, there must be dextral, sinistral motion on one side, dextral motion on the other side. Do we see that? So let's look at this area in particular. We know for sure there's sinistral motion here, left lateral, right? Do we see a similar dextral motion on this side? Well, interestingly, when we come to this area, what we actually see is that this area is up, this area is down, this area here is up, that area is down. And that motion, again, is not dextral. It's actually sinistral. So we see sinistral motion on one side. And again, we see sinistral motion on the other side. These faults actually cut into um, this building over here and actually breaks the, the foundation of it. Um, so it's actually quite significant faulting as well. So we see a lot of this sinistral motion um, being replicated across the area. So not only is sinistral motion occurring here, it's also occurring on the other side. And in, another thing is that this area is actually topographically higher. 
why would the area actually be slipping up dip? Right? So here is up, there is down. The topographical field here is actually the, the, the plateau area. So we we don't see the dextral motion in this in this feature. The dextral motion, if anything, occurs inside here. We do see faults which are dipping towards the east. And along this area over here, there's a significant amount of faults which are dipping eastward. And that fits with the fact that we should be having um, slippage along here, which ties perfectly with where the toe thing seems to stop as well. So we've got our sinistral motion on this side and likely dextral motion on this side with our scars occurring here near the house, Mr. Nobby's house, where we've got our 20 foot, 25 foot dip slip faults, which are all dipping towards the south. And that perfectly fits with a landslide model. But the rest of the area does not fit with the landslide model. So I have no problem with taking um, um, this professor's uh, map over here and just adjusting it to say that inside this area in particular is where the landslide occurs. But what occurs up here is something a bit different. And that ties perfectly with the motion, with the areas are continuing to slip currently. So the another theory that was put forward was liquefaction. So liquefaction is a feature that, that is very common to occur after an earthquake. It basically is an, um, it basically means that your, your water saturated reservoirs in the area um, have become disturbed and their loose packing basically becomes tighter. So the grains are pushed against each other and you have water being expelled. You sometimes also have sand being expelled as dikes and stuff in the area. Um, and this usually occurs in very unconsolidated sediments. <clears throat> so could liquefaction be the reason why this area slipped? Maybe we would have had an expulsion of water, which then loosened up um, the uppermost layer of rocks to slip. Well, we have a couple issues with that theory. And that is that the rocks in this area are late Miocene in age, which means that they're about eight million years old. They've undergone many, many um, earthquakes in the past, and they're not unconsolidated. They have actually um, liquefied, if anything, many, many millions of years ago. They're also dipping towards the north. And the slippage that we observe is going towards the south. So there is something that, that there's a problem there because you are, you are basically expecting the rocks to slide against its structural green. Um, some boreholes were drilled in the area to basically see if there were significant sandstones at depth. Um, that could have assisted in this liquefaction theory. We would need um, a significant reservoir at depth to produce, um, or, or to, which can be liquefied, to then allow surface areas to slip. Um, but both boreholes that were drilled did not find any significant sandstones. At a, signif at a really significant depth in this area, we do know that there are low cruise sandstones in this area, but they're all folded and dipping towards the south, dipping towards the north. So really for liquefaction theory to, to work here, we would, it would require that the various beds within this lower cruise, alternating sands, shales, sands, shales, and sands, they would all need to sort of liquefy in, and then allow slippage to occur. But really, the cross-cutting of, um, of uh, a surface across all of these beds is actually something we refer to as a fault rather than a liquefaction. So along the south coast, 
of the country. This is actually um, a nice spot map of the area where field geologists would have gone out in this area way back in the 1950s and 60s and stuff. And we still go to these areas today. And we look at all of the dips along the, the coast, along the cliffs along the coast. And we clearly see that all of the dips are actually northward, dipping, dipping all dipping towards the north. And here's a, here's a drone shot of the, some of the cliffs we have along the south coast. And they're all showing this nice northerly dip. So the crest of the southern and decline is somewhere a bit further offshore or along the areas of the beach. The scale, that's me over there, just smaller than the, my laser pointer. So we've got really nice dips all going towards the north. So if the dips are going towards the north, it's rather um, uh, against the grain for the areas to be slipping towards the south. The other issue, which we're not going to try to discuss here is that there are so many other places across Trinidad that, that actually has unconsolidated material that could have under, undergone liquefaction, but there was no reported liquefaction anywhere else. So why would liquefaction occur here as opposed to anywhere else? So really what transpired, which theory honors all of the data sets? But we've got one more data set to add to this. So in March of 2019, the APG partnered with Touchstone, UE Seismic, um, the UE APG student chapter, the UE um, student chapter of the SEG, and the Georgia Society of Toronto Tobago to undertake um, a seismic tomography or resistivity study across this area. On that day, we were able to run five lines across the area. So this is line one, then line two, line three, line four, and line five. And these will, will basically to give us a sort of perspective as to what's going on below the surface in this area that was disturbed by this faulting. So this is a 3D sort of in, um, view of the area. I've also highlighted on where the boreholes were drilled. Here's one of those boreholes, and here's another one of the boreholes occurring along here. Some GPS markers were also put into the area to monitor the emotion of the area since the earthquake. And, and, um, and we record that most of the motion again occurs along in this area. So here are the lines, like again, line one, two, three, four, and then five is sort of west to east. So I'll quickly go through some of these lines. So um, this is line one. This is north, that is south. And re seismic tomography is basically highlighting for us um, the, the resistivity of the rocks in the subsurface. And resistivity obviously would be um, depending on the sort of fluids that we have inside the rocks. So we expect that our salt water reservoirs, if they are, um, would have lower resistivities, whereas freshwater reservoirs um, would, would record higher resistivities. We also expect that the shales themselves should, ha should have lower resistivities than any of the sandstones um, present. So what we recognize along this north-south line over here. This is the area where the fault rupture crosses it right along here. And we see um, high resistivities occurring right along where the fault occurs. And it also occurs at a subtle um, um, inclination as well too. Um, this, is, uh, this is a line with no vertical exaggeration at all. And you can see it's pretty steep. <clears throat> So we recognize that there's a, that that's the fault rupture and it's highlighting uh, with high resistivities in this case because um, the rainwater or rainfall has actually started to travel down these faults and these cracks and, um, and go down into the subsurface and that's actually giving us um, these higher resistivities. So we see, we see on line two, line two is across here, um, there are some 
very subtle differences in the resistivity. And we've sort of modeled that they probably are related to beds, different types of um, lit lithology then. So maybe silty and then clay and then silty and then clay beds. And they generally all dip towards the north, which, it, which fits with the regional sort of picture. So we believe that there are lower cruise sands with salt water in them and they're all dipping towards the north. <clears throat> As we go across the line tree, line tree occurs again where the major fault rupture crosses the road. We've got really, really high resistivities here as this is an area where the fault is quite um, open. <clears throat> and uh, we, we're seeing a lot of fresh water entering the fault along here. Again, pretty steep um, zone where, of high resistivities. Um, so I'll jump across the line three on line three, sorry, line five. Line five is this west to east line running along here. Here's where one of those boreholes were drilled in this bluish dominant area over here. And they found predominantly clay throughout that borehole. Um, again, the line is about 160 meters long and um, we're able to see down to about 40 or something, 45 feet, 45 meters or so below the surface. Um, we see some high resistive, higher resistivities, it's all relative, occurring at depth over here. Then there's a sort of break with mostly um, lower resistivities and then another zone of high resistivities again. And we're thinking maybe that this is something related to the typical tear faulting across the area where there's a change in plunge of the beds. And those are usually areas where we have tear faults occurring. <clears throat> so when we um, map those sort of beds, and I'm using beds loosely, beds are not necessarily sand rich zones, they may be silty zones or just zones of subtly higher resistivities. We can see about five or so of those beds running across these lines, lines one and two. And then we can trap at least two of these beds across the remainder of the lines. And they fit the regional strike and plunge of the, of the, of the rocks in the area. Um, and we also know that we're younging towards the north. So we expect uh, the regional dip to be towards the north as well. Um, for scale, there's actually a well called um, Antilles Erin 1, just off the, the map here towards the north. And that actually has some of these lower cruise sands um, with oil, actually resistive sands. And those actually tie based on dip to some of these beds over here. So we know that there's actually sand there then, and those sands may be um, becoming silty towards the south um, and they match with the sort of bedding that we see here. <clears throat> So as, as, as after this exercise on March 23rd, we were able to say that the two boreholes basically drilled in areas to 60 feet where, we, where there was mostly shale and that tied to the low resistive zones along those lines. And then um, lines one and three um, cross the large fall rupture. They have high resistivities, likely due to fresh water traveling down them. And we believe that those falls are no less than 45 degrees, suggesting that they are very steep. And lines four and five, we saw these disjointed pods of high resistivities, um, which likely depicts rotated fall blocks as well. So the resistivity data suggests that the main fall rupture is steep and that the associated small falls have, um, <clears throat> have less dip than it, and they're probably antitactic to it. And so at that time, we believed that the damage to the area was due to the reactivation of a pre-existing northwest to southeast trending fault with sinistral slippage of this fault being aided by possible mud fault in the area. Then on January 20th, 2020, this year, we actually had the occurrence of mud volcanism along this part of the main fault rupture. 
So seven vents basically popped up along this area over here. And note I said before that when the earthquake occurred and we came to this area, there was an area over here that was quite muddy, was a big mud pool, and it was actually bubbling. But we weren't quite sure if it was actually an emerging mud volcano. So again, this is the main fault rupture, and these are all the, the areas that are, are bubbling and constantly bubbling. So this is what the area looked like before, just after the earthquake, actually, just after the earthquake. And then this is what the area looks like now, with all these um, <clears throat> mud flows occurring from small vents along it. And these are some, what some of the vents look like. They occur even in the roadway as well too. So since since um, the the roads were broken, the uh, the Ministry of Works would have come and fixed the roads by sort of bulldozing through the fault and um, spreading some new material and mud walking actually emerging in the middle of the road itself. <clears throat> and this is a spot I told you that um, one of the young ladies was standing up. It uh, has actually become um, one. Uh, zone of um, mud vents. <clears throat> so that brings me to the end of my talk. Um, I just want to say that you know, thanks for having me and um, I <clears throat> encourage you to integrate, integrate, integrate. Take every bit of data and the best model is a model that basically adheres to all of the data sets, even all of the independent data sets as well. Um, we had quite a, a lot of fun with students, with different groups um, visiting this area. There was quite a lot of structural geology to learn from, from this event. And um, yeah, thanks again to APG for having me and never stop exploring. Okay, thank you very much, Zavi, for this um, amazing presentation. We'll begin the 30 minutes of question and answer rounds now. Um, I, I see we have two questions already. Ideally, we'll work with one question per person, unless, um, and if we have extra time, well, we'll continue with other questions. Um, so you all can leave your questions now. Uh, Zav, I guess we'll start with the first one. Um, from, from what I'm getting from your question, yeah, they're basically asking, you say that you see a lot of dip slip faults, um, yeah. but they don't see any lithified rock, just hard mud. Um, and from what I understand from your question, I think they're trying to ask, what's the difference between a dip slip fault versus a normal fault? So no, normal fault is a type of dip slip fault, right? Yeah. It's a, a normal fault is just where the hanging wall moves downward, right? As opposed to the, to, to the foot wall. In this case, yes, um, I understand what you're saying that the rock is not it's not actually rock per se, right? That we're looking at. We're looking at the ground surface has actually moved. But as the ground surface moved um, in a dip slip orientation, um, in an in a extensional sort of orientation in that case, we actually see the um, silicon sides being recorded from uh, even in um, very much muddy, um, unconsolidated material. Right, so yes, um, most of those those features aren't preserved still because they are easily weathered out. But um, yeah, uh, any sort of motion along any fault or a road or um, a, just a muddy material will leave some sort of um, scraping sort of effect, which you can record and look at. So um, I encourage you to also. Let me just um, go back on the slide back and I'll encourage you all to go to this link. I forgot to point it on the first slide. Um, so if, if you all go to this link, right, um, you can actually um, open up a, a, a really nice app of this area, which includes the drone um, topography, um, the, the drone imagery and all of the, the second sides that we recorded. You can zoom straight in and actually see the falls and some of the second sides. There are actually pictures posted to the various areas. So it's all nicely populated up 
with um, pictures posted of the second sides and stuff in the various areas. So yes, it's um, yes, it's it's rather um, muddy material, but even in this muddy material, because of the the um, drastic slippage of the uh, of the rocks, it actually um, scraped each other, and you can actually see some some motion along it. Um, I see the next question is to how to interpret the seismic tomography data. So the seismic tomography data, um, basically it's, it's telling us areas of, let me just get to it, right? Um, it's pointing out areas of, of variations in resistivity across the area, right? So, what we're what we're seeing is that the it's still relative. It's not nece, it's not necessarily uh, we we won't necessarily take this as the the um of the as a gospel of what's going on below here, but we're looking at the relative changes of the resistivity across the area, and we're also trying to integrate with this the understanding of how the beds should be dipping, what's the regional sort of dip, what's the regional style of faulting in here. So we can make some sense of this. Yes, there are lots of spurious points as well too, but we expect that because near surface, there are a bunch of things happening, right? Um, we've put in the, the well data, the core, which showed us that we've got really uh, muddy material over here. We looked at the location of the fault and we actually see high resistivity is there. Um, and uh, so by putting these other forms of, of data of the area, we're able to try to reason out what's, um, what's true, what's not, and, and what might actually be representative of, of the faults in the area. I, all right, so I see, um, were any of the houses affected? Yes, so that one house in particular was really badly affected. Um, as I showed, the roadway to the house was completely broken down. And, and overall, the, the, the area that the house was actually sitting on had gone down by a net 45 or so feet. From where, from actual ground surface where it was right before, um, the there were other houses that were affected too, as I showed on the on the western side of the area. Those houses were also um, the foundation of those houses were broken, and um, the the ponds of most of the farmers were also really highly fractured. I'm surprised the government decided to simply pave over the road with all the charge activity. <clears throat> well, um, yeah, uh, you, you, you could look at it that way that, um, you know, this, this area would probably continue to slip. It is predominantly an agricultural area and there isn't that much traffic going through the area as well. So in terms of um, trying to to make the area accessible to the farmers again, so they can continue to, to do what they like to do. Um, this was an easy fix for now. Um, but if you look at things that way, in, in terms of um, why should we just pave over something, then um, Trinidad is quite an active country, you know, tectonically. So, um, until we actually in, implement proper building codes across the area, um, paving over something that was damaged before is pretty much what is, is accustomed to. What's the composition of the mud volcanoes in the area? Um, so the mud volcanoes, they tend to spew out um, these deep water clays. Actually, I may not have mentioned that at the end, but the muds that we that were coming out from the mud volcanoes, the new mud, mud vents actually, we were able to age date those muds based on the foraminifera that's, that came up with the, with the mud flows. Um, and those forearms actually dated back to early Miocene. Early Miocene 
it's about 18 or 18 to 14 or so million years old and those rocks seismically when we map those rocks in this area they are still at about eight to nine thousand feet below the ground so it suggests to us that for mud volcanoes to actually occur there this has got to be um, a significant fall that taps into a, a, a very interesting plumbing, plumbing system on its way down um, the mud volcanoes um, get uh, are fed by a high pressure um, reservoir at depth there are um, sandstones at further depth and the, and the Cretaceous rocks and mid Miocene rocks as well. And those um, high, highly pressurized fluids flow upwards, they entrain clays along the way, and, and as such, you end up with a, a slurry at surface. Um, can vegetation play a major role to prevent slumping and fall movement? Um, yeah, yeah, yes, but um, the area was pretty much vegetated even before, right? Um, the main fault rupture actually cut through a uh, forest and actually broke the trees and the roots and branches and everything on the way down. So when the earth really wants to move, it moves, right? Um, you can use vegetation to try to hold together the air that is still slipping now, um, but um, it, 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 will, it will more likely stabilize on its own eventually. Um, a brand new outcrop was essentially created at the Totras on the beach and new discoveries there. So yeah, um, actually, so the, the, these nice lower cruise clays were pushed upward and um, within those lower crews we saw boulders of, um, of very coarse sandstones. Um, those boulders are what we typically in Trinidad refer to as Herrera looking like reservoirs. That's a popular mid Miocene reservoir that is sought out for um, hydrocarbon exploration. Um, so you saw lots of that entrained in those clays. Um, and there was also some, um, it smelled of oil as well too. Okay, um, so while we wait for other questions, possibly I have one. Um, I know like when we visited the area, we were talking about possible continued movement of the area. Um, I was wondering if you can talk about any movement that we've possibly seen since then. And like, I know this is probably not your area of expertise, but general safety of the area. Yeah, so so the the so we we actually monitored the movement of this um, slip slipping mass um, for a while. It continued to slip, um, but it actually started to slow down in in terms of the amount of slippage along it. Um, um, to the point now that um, that we're not seeing significant slippage. It's below resolution of the drone mapping tools. Um, I know the the um, Seismic research group as um, and surveyors group have some stations out there, and maybe they could get some um, provide some more G, um, accurate GPS motion uh, at those points. But um, I mean, previously the area was slipping on scale of meters per week, right? And now it's down to less than a couple millimeters per uh, per month. So it's really um, decreased now. Um, and actually farming has gone back to, to norm now. In terms of um, safety, it's, 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 it's unlikely that, um, that, that the area may continue to slip again. Um, uh, these faults tend to be lubricated by the mud volcanism. Um, we see mud volcanism coming up in one of the areas now and maybe it's hard to say, but maybe uh, we might see if there are mud our earthquakes in the future, maybe um, there may be other faults that, that might be um, uh, on the verge of, of, of moving as opposed to, to this one. So relatively, it's, um, it's pretty safe to, to traverse now. And um, actually a lot of folks have gone to the new mud vents um, to collect mud and to actually see it themselves. There are lots of mud walking us further towards the east that people tend to visit quite often. 
Yeah. Okay. Um, I guess one more from me, which actually has to do with the slide you have up right now, um, with the yeah. seismic typography on this line specifically. You mentioned that you, the you believe that the higher the higher resistivity that you see at some of the fault zones is possibly because of uh, rainwater flowing th along the faults. Yeah. But on this same slide, um, the other fault on the right hand side has a yeah. bit of a bluer or a lower resistivity. Do you think that this yeah. might be like early indications of mud coming up um, or no? So yeah, I, I get what you're saying. It's hard to say in this one. Um, there are some faults, some faults are preferably open. So we got bigger apertures as opposed to others, right? We saw bricks occurring over here. So we thought that, that maybe that there's a fault inside here. Um, yes, we do see this sort of um, low resistivity climbing up per se, a fault um, in places where we have mud volcanism, but there's no sign of mud volcanism in this area as yet. Um, so we have, have not been able to, to prove that this is, this is um, a fault with possible mud coming up it. Um, but this is actually the, the fault that has mud volcanism coming up it right now. And it doesn't show um, low resistivities climbing up the fault. Maybe it's rather skewed because of the amount of water going down along the fault as well. Okay, thanks. Um, we have one question here in the chat. They were asking, were any sinkholes created because of liquefaction? No, actually. Um, so there were no sinkholes. In fact, the area was just and still remains really fractured. So none of the ponds um, that the farmers had uh, um, and, and have are uh, retaining water. And, and I mean, these ponds were on the scale of like Olympic sized swimming pools in some cases, right? And they just can't retain any more water. Um, so no water was expelled at the time of the earthquake and no water has been retained at surface because of the cracks everywhere. Um, no sand was, uh, was expelled either. So there was very little um, evidence of potential liquefaction in the first place, like your typical um, signs of liquefaction. You don't, you don't see that. And the lithology of the area is predominantly clay. Clays don't really liquefact. The sands preferably liquefact. So you're working with an area where the surface geology tells you that you're dealing with a deep water deposit. The lower cruise is a deep water clay and it entrains um, um, these lower cruise turbidites. And so it's rather unlikely for this rock in particular to undergo liquefaction as opposed to any of the younger delta X and Trinidad, which are sand dominated. Okay, um, we have another question here. Mud volcanoes, um, are mud volcanoes synonymous with mud diapers? Um, so, not no, no, not necessarily. Um, mud, mud diapers tend to they do not um, they do not necessarily breach the surface. There are areas where you have um, clays um, being uh, stacked, uh, sort of um, stacked on top of each other um, at depth, and uh, that tends to occur in in a, a long area, a long faults, yes. Um, but they also tend to occur at the base of, of um, large scale normal faults where you have a, a significant amount of overpressuring as one um, area slips versus the other, preferably. Um, but the mud diapers, the mud volcanoes that we have, they tend to occur uh, along and decline, so compressional, more compressional style features. And um, and yeah, they occur along the faults and they're charged by the reservoirs at depth. I think I saw one more. Uh, yeah, there's a new one. Um, they would ask if you over time or would rain enter and 
pause for the slippage. Um, so it, it could could occur um, within the the area that is um, predominantly dip slip, right? Because remember that area has a shallower sort of detachment. It's um, it's land it's is gravity driven, right? And so if the area um, becomes overladen with um, rainwaters, it could um, slip up further. So far, we've actually had um, a couple of rainy um, periods, but um, no significant slippage during those. Okay, um, we have a comment from Varindra here concerning the resistivity profiles. Um, I think he just said to mention that because the surface is not flat or even, mm -hmm. and depending on how deep the electrodes are, um, where, where, you, where you run the survey, it can actually give uncertainties in the measurements. So what you're looking at is something more relative and it's just to give a good idea of what's going on in the area and not to be too specific about it. Yes, exactly. So that's why we use it as, with a, as a sort of backdrop to the sort of geology of the area that we understand. So we've tried to use this, yes, with a degree, uh, with a grain of salt, if you want to say, right? Mm -hmm. um, so we observe these features, we look at the anomalies and try to see if the anomalies match or fit or don't match at all with um, the geology that we expect in the area. Awesome. Um, anyone else has any more questions you'd like to leave in this section? We have some time remaining. Okay, so if we, sorry, I have one other question. Was, was the water, water obtained from wells usable after the event? Well, I guess it didn't have any water in the wells. No, um, so, so the wells that I spoke about, those were boreholes. Um, they did not obtain any water. Um, they didn't find any sand actually at all. Um, so no reservoir was found in this area. Um, and the other wells that were further north, like the Aran wells, those were actually oil wells. So those um, produced oil, but they were further north of this area that was affected. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I think if there are no more questions at this time, We'll end the session there. So Xavier, um, thank you again very much for this excellent talk. I'm certain it was very insightful and greatly appreciated.